Good evening, everybody. Welcome to uh, Wednesday night here at Liberty Lake. Stefan's joining me this evening. And uh, tonight we're going to watch James call the church murderers and adulterers. What, a, what an amazing uh, claim to fame that, that they had in his time. I, I, I think it's going to be pretty convicting, uh, at least it was for us. I hope, hope you stay around and, and that you experience, um, one, the hope of Christ, but also the conviction of his word as we address that tonight. I do want to uh, share with you guys that we are working uh, as a staff and uh, here at Liberty Lake Church, uh, preparing for reopening as a church. And we uh, were working on the CDC recommendations and, and all the pieces that are coming together. And I get it. I know. I heard the statement from President Trump. I know many of us are ready to go right now. But I want you to know that, that the elders um, and I, we are watching that very carefully. And as the amazing justice system in our beautiful country finishes its work, as, as Inslee and Trump do their dance, and, and as that comes uh, to completion, we are going to be prepared to move um, and, and begin to open up and, and start doing uh, church services. But we want to do it carefully. We want to do it with wisdom, and we want to do it with care and compassion for each person that will be here. Uh, and so the staff are working hard on that. And um, we are we're moving forward to that uh, to that end. So please be praying for wisdom in that. Please be praying for direction and um, for insight on how to balance all of those things, the recommendations that are coming, in, the needs of the people that are going to be here, uh, and that whole entire process. So, man, thanks for joining us, Stefan. Thanks for being here. Yeah, um, for how has your study been this week in this passage? Has it been just joyful and filled with all kinds of excitement? <laughs> Uh, well, it's, I can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, that's why it's, I asked it that I, way. I, it's been a little burdensome almost. Yeah. Just like, just wrestling with it. I guess like Jacob wrestled with God. That's what we're doing here. And, and it's, he's definitely calling the church out. And, and I feel called out in this passage. Very much sure. so. I think whenever you have a text that includes adultery, murder, and warfare, you, you pretty much are setting yourselves up for a conviction service. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that that's how we should enter. We should really, as a church, be recognize that that's, that's what James is trying to do to the church. He's calling for them to wake up and to recognize what's happening in the context of their hearts and therefore being practiced mm -hmm. in their church. And this was only, you know, 20 years after the resurrection. I mean, this wasn't very long after. It was a... This is the, a fresh church. Yeah. You know. Where they actually re remembered what happened. Yeah. Some of them saw it mm -hmm. and lived it. I think what they're going to struggle with this even more than they did. <laughs> I believe so. Well, that's what, that's what really was the conviction, right? Is that this idea of idolatry and, and adultery that, that we're going to see actually, I think, uh, played out in this text uh, today um, is almost more applicable to the church of today. Than, it, than I would have thought it would have been to them. Mm -hmm. So what passage are we in? We're in uh, James 4, 1 through 5. James 4, 1 through 5. I, I, I want to encourage you to open your Bibles, get out your pens. Uh, if, if you're okay with marking up your Bibles, if you're not, grab out a notebook and, and write down some stuff. But I really want to encourage you to prepare tonight um, to wrestle with what, what James is challenging the church to do. And the reality is we have an outline here. Uh, Stefan and I have a plan. We have an idea of where we want to go, um, but we both committed to the Lord and, and to you and, and to ourselves as we were coming out here saying, God, whatever you want to do, we're going to do. So if we don't get through all of it, we're not going to rush. We're not going to, we're not going to fight to do that. So open your Bibles, join us tonight in James chapter 4, uh, starting in verse 1 and going through verse 5. I've asked Stefan if he would read that text for us tonight. Verse 1, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? 
Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. I realize that in this text, we actually, the, the, the paragraph continues. Mm-hmm. Uh, James was not done there. <laughs> no. uh, he, he continues no. to speak. Uh, but for the reality of time and, and just for, for our time tonight, um, I, I think we both have agreed that we probably needed to cut it off there and, and we'll see how far we get and we'll just continue to pick up the pieces as we go over the next uh, week or two as we move forward. Um, are there conflicts in the church? This is for you. you. Do you have conflict in the church? Any quarrels? The, the answer is, um, unfortunately, yes. Uh, that, that, that's, that's the serious reality um, of the church. And what Paul or uh, James is saying, it seems to be saying, is that the, the problem with that, the reason is, is because of this warfare, this spiritual warfare that's, that's happening between our, our hearts our, or our souls and our flesh. Um, and, and, and in that process, in that battle, the consequences or the results of that are quarrels and fights among us. You could almost say, uh, and this, we were talking about this earlier, you could almost say, if you have quarreling and fighting in your church at any point, then you have adultery, a spiritual adultery happening in your church there, idolatry, because you're not in one yeah. relationship well, I don't with think the you Father. Can get away from that. I mean, when he asked, what's the source of quarrels and conflicts among you, I, I, what has the source always been? You know, not, not just in the church. The source has always been the pride of man and our propensity to seek our own. Our own pleasures, right? And yep. and it's not; it hasn't changed, you know. No. But the difference is, we've been given the Holy Spirit. You know, we have the mind of Christ, and that puts this dichotomy in our lives of this war, this battle, and that's what he's talking about. Yeah, that battle didn't exist before, and it doesn't exist for the rest of the world. Right. It, that but, you mentioned that earlier. That was very interesting. What, what, what the comment you made earlier as we were talking about this, how this wouldn't be a problem if it wasn't for the warfare. Yeah. Because, I mean, you were just, the world doesn't have it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The world is united both in spirit and body against God. And because we have been freed from the bondage of sin and put under the bondage to righteousness, we are now... War has been enacted. It's been proclaimed, and we're a part of that. And we have to stand up. We, we're we're a part of this war. I love that that thought that you had earlier. Was we're free to go to war. We're we're free to engage in the war that we're in. Now, I mean that's that's part of the freedom that we've been given is to actually begin to fight. Well, let's look at what what I love about this is that James is using language that we know other apostles use in, in one, of my, one of our favorite passages, uh, I, I think it should be one of our favorite passages, is uh, Romans uh, chapter 7, mostly because uh, Paul actually goes through and he goes, ah, my flesh, like I do what I don't want to do and I don't do what I should do. And uh, my favorite translation was for my boys and I, we used to say it this way, that um, I don't do what I know I should do and I do do. But I know I shouldn't do. I do do. <laughs> yeah, we intentionally did the do do with my boys so that they would see the. That's not good because you know for young boys that's yeah. a great way to describe. Oh, remember that. Not good stuff. Um, but most of the English translations I've read recently have have gotten away from that so that <laughs> seventh grade boys can't have as much fun with it. But Paul says in Romans he talks about this warfare. He talks about this battle that's happening, and I think he I think he gives us a really great. Um, illustration or discussion around that. So let me read for you uh, Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 21 uh, and going through 8, uh, uh, chapter 8, verse 2. <clears throat> Romans seven twenty one says, So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. 
But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Therefore, excuse me, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ from the law of sin and of death. And one of the reasons I wanted us to have chapter 8, verse 2 is because when I read 7, 21 through the end of the chapter, I'm like, ah, what's the, what good is the battle? I mean, even Paul, who we many people would think would be one of the bastions of faith, one of the great apostles of, of, of the Christian faith, is saying there's this war waged in my life, and, and I want to do this, but my flesh is doing this, and I'm stuck in this battle. Oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to save me? You'd made a comment when we were talking about this earlier about what this war is like. The word that he's using there is more than just a situation that we're in. Yeah, so let me let me find the passage that it was in, but it's not just to wage war. The, the word in the Greek is actually to strategize. And... So there, it's actively working it's act, against it's, yeah, I the mean, law of God. And we don't think about the members of our flesh <clears throat> having, having the ability to strategize against our new mind. Right, you know? right. Um, but that's what it's doing. Oh. And, and if we're not actively strategizing against it, what's going to happen? <laughs> we're going to lose. <laughs> yeah. We're going to lose. Yeah. I mean that that's we we've basically surrendered and given up at that point if we're not engaged in in the active battle of this war. And we can take that back to to Romans eight. You know, God has saved us, and we are we have overcome in Christ. Right. So there is that aspect of of our eternal redemption and. Our position in Christ being 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 one of hope, yes, and excitement, knowing knowing that we have a relationship with God, right, and, and victory, and that we have a future, with him, <clears throat> yeah, um, yeah, and victory. Uh, <clears throat> but that doesn't mean that this life, the here and now, the present day, that it's easy. I mean, it it would be easy if we didn't have something to wage war against, right? If we weren't aware of it. Mm-hmm. And that's why that's why the law came to put us under sin, so that we'd see we'd see the enemy. Yeah, to expose. Otherwise, we can't even the see the enemy. Right. I mean, just shows you how limited we are in our own perceptions. We were talking earlier too about this because this is not something. This isn't something new. This isn't James isn't uncovering this this great mystery that hasn't been present for all time. Because this war, this, this uh, battle started all the way back with Adam and Eve. Mm-hmm. In fact, it's in the prophecy of, of Genesis chapter 3, where the snake will bruise his heel, but the son, the coming son that will be born, will, will crush the serpent's head. I mean, that's, that's, if, there's, if that's not the picture of a prophetic war that's coming, mm-hmm. and that then happens throughout all of, etern- all, all of creation up to this point, I don't know how else we are to to look at that, um, but but clearly this has been happening. You were saying that um, uh, we were talking about uh, as we get into this the the relationship side of of this particular um, discussion because in chapter in chapter four of James and verse two, he he begins to explain what's happening in the lives of the church and and he he says your desires. Uh, you desire and you do not have, so you murder. He literally calls them murderers. Not typically what you do in a gentle uh, kind of like, hey guys, this is something you should think about dealing with. You know, this is this is probably a bad habit. We should think about changing. He called them murderers. Mm-hmm. Um, my guess is somebody was probably a little upset at that in that you know in, in that in that context and then he uses this word covet this this 
passionate desire, this this striving for something that you can't obtain, so you fight and quarrel. He's describing the activity of the church where they're coveting one, they're coveting things that they can't have. They're they're angry with one another, and so they're they're actually guilty of murder. Now, how how do we get to the guilty of murder? We it's in Matthew, right? Maybe you should read. Um, Maybe you should read that passage for us, the Matthew five twenty one, where Jesus is actually describing for the for the Jews at the time how the heart is the problem. It's not just the external behavior of the believer. Mm-hmm. And what, by the way, what translation are you using? Just this so everybody NASB NASB. All right, yep. just so you know, if it's not the same on the screen, it's okay. It's the <laughs> NASB. All right, verse twenty one. Uh, you have heard that the ancients were, were told, you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court, and whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court, and whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Huh. <laughs> so. Definitely. <laughs> There's definitely a heart issue here. There's a heart yeah. issue, right? Because you're guilty before the court of murder. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of the translations actually say guilty of murder in them to, mm-hmm. to tie this whole thing together. But Jesus is saying that if if you're angry with your brother, you're guilty at that level. Mm-hmm. James is saying that you're that you're quarreling and fighting. I'm kind of thinking anger might be involved in this. I mean, maybe I'm being naive. <laughs> and just assuming that I'm get angry and therefore I want to fight, everybody must get angry and therefore want to fight. Because that's not that's not you. Oh yeah, no, no, <laughs> that's not that's not any of the other people we have here helping us um, <clears throat> tonight, or any of you that are watching. Right? Nobody gets angry and wants to fight in the church, and yet here Jesus is saying it's a heart issue because even if you know, and, and we were ta- we'll, we'll look at this um, in. And um, I think, well, actually, I guess we were supposed to read First Peter 2, weren't we? Um, I totally missed that, but that's okay. We'll skip it tonight. Go back and read First Peter 2, verses 11 through 12. Because one of, the, one of the challenges that we see in that text in First Peter 2 is that he actually challenges the believers to change their mindset and understand that they're not of this world. But in that, to live in such a way that when they face judgment, when they stand before God at the final visitation, that our lives are then evidence of that reality, of the truth of, the, of God, the relationship that's available for God, and, and that we become part of the evidence against them. And my tendency is to say, man, I got I to gotta perform right. <laughs> like, I got to fix this, because this can't be in public. And when, when I mean this, I mean what's happening in my heart can't that that's not appropriate for public consumption if I want people to think that I'm godly. Yeah, I, I, that's why we we don't always tell the whole truth to people. We 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 leave we live secret lives, yeah. you know, even as Christians, yep. because we're afraid of of that condemnation. It, because we know better, right? You know, but. Because in the war, we're, we're awake to the fact that it's sin. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, I mean, if we weren't awake to that fact, then we wouldn't be hiding something. You know, the, the guilt of, of knowing sin, knowing right from wrong, good from evil, yeah. is, is something that is present in us because of Jesus Christ. Because we are freed by him mm-hmm. to actually engage in this war. To be actively, strategically engaged. In fact, that's probably one of the passages that we probably should have grabbed out of here is Ephesians chapter six, where we deal with the spiritual warfare, the armament of spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. But Paul very, very clearly in Ephesians chapter six says, We have to stand up. When you've done everything to stand, stand. Mm -hmm. Like, Okay, yeah. so start running the race. Get in, go, get in. Yeah. Engage. It's and it's not about being perfect. That's not and that's that's the danger here is is it's easy to come away from this conversation thinking, "Oh, like I need to be perfect. I I need to 
I need to conquer and be victorious. Me, and we're going back to the pleasures. We're going back to the me, 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 yeah. pride issue and everything. But that's, that's not what it's about. You mean religiousness can be about pride? <laughs> Ooh. No, I, that's not nice. <laughs> he said <Yeah>. it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh, I'm in trouble now. <laughs> We're in big trouble. That's right. Let's just not call marriage warfare tonight <laughs> or a battlefield, whatever well, that is, battle. Right? Yeah. It um, is, but... <laughs> it is. Well, because every aspect of our life is. It is. That, yeah, that's, that's, what... that's the ultimate reality in this that I think as, as Christians, we've way too often, we want to simplify this down to being... The battle's over. The war's been won. We, we want to run all the way to the end of Revelation and say, this is all done. It's conquered. It's complete. We can, we can just coast in. And that's not what the Bible says. It, it was interesting. Uh, Stefan and I were actually wrestling with this in uh, earlier uh, this evening as we were preparing for this, and both of us started saying, man, all we're doing is quoting Scripture right now. We kept, we kept going back to other text after other text after other text going, this is just a huge web of the reality of the gospel in light of a God who engaged a, a, a people, a creation that was condemned because of their choice to sin. And it's the whole gospel is wrapped up in aspects of this particular passage. I mean, we could, I mean, we could keep quoting scripture. Go back to the story of Hosea. You know? right. Oh, yeah. I mean, we we've already disobeyed against God, you know, in in Adam and Eve's sin, um, and God restores humanity to Himself. He makes yes. a way, yes, for men to know Him. But yep. I think I would argue that we can't know God without a battle, without a struggle. You know, if we don't engage in that war, yeah, that is that is part of knowing God. Is huh. is is applying, is using those weapons he's given you, you know, cutting between the good and the evil, defining things in your life, yeah, you know, and seeing the victory and the power that he gives you um, in your obedience to him. Ha having to use the shield of faith to actually trust him when things can't yeah. possibly work. <laughs> Buckle and hide behind Yeah. Him. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay, never mind. I'm not going to say that. I don't want that recorded. <laughs> um, I was just thinking to myself how convicting that reality is, uh, the, it, the contrast of a prosperity gospel or the idea in Christianity that it, once I become a Christian, everything in my life should be good. Everything in my life should be easy. I, I, I'm the lead singer from Hawk Nelson. I, I don't know if, it, I mean, I'm sure some people know that. Some of you are like, Hawk who? Um, it, it, which is fine, because I don't know his name either. Um, and it's not because I don't care about him as a human, I just don't care about him as a performer. Um, but the, the reality is, he, he just came out publicly um, this last week uh, denouncing his faith, that he doesn't believe in God. And he was talking about the God of the Old Testament and the contradiction between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament, and how he, he can't accept that contradiction and therefore, he doesn't believe in God anymore. And if God was a good God, he wouldn't allow this. And give God, it, it was all this stuff about going, well, if God's not going to do everything the way I think he should, he can't be God. But that's the problem with that theology. With that, and it is theology at that point. It's a view in who God is. It's mm -hmm. the thought about what God, you know, how you're translating who God is and what he's. You, can, he's not God anymore. Uh, he's not our God anymore at that point. And and so. This young man grew up in the church, and he, he developed a self-worship idolatry that now in his adulthood, he's finally expressing in full array. And in no, no fault, I'm not, I'm not saying, what I'm not doing is pointing fingers at him and saying, ooh, he's horrible. Part of what I'd love to do is say, man, would you come and walk, me, walk with me through the Old Testament? I want to show you the God of the Old Testament, the God of, I hope we can get to it tonight, because the God of Exodus 20 is a God of passionate intimacy that is, that is yearning jealously for the intimate relationship with his creation that he was willing to send his son to die for. Mm -hmm. That was not an angry God. There's a, there's, <clears throat> so the Greek word to know, to nosco, it's very interesting because it's used like, with um, 
with Joshua, not Joshua, um, with Mary and her husband. Joseph. <laughs> Joseph, thank you. Um, Mary says, I have not known a man. Mm. And after, after Jesus is born and she hasn't had relationship with a man, um, Joseph, it's, in Scripture, we're told that Joseph knew his wife. Right, right. And even though that's kind of hard to think about in our relationship with God, it's the same word used when we know God. Right. There's an into, a, a deep intimacy there. Um, that's how we know God. You know? A- and that's absolutely. how he wants to be known is, is intimately. Yeah. Well, and it ties. It goes all the way back. Um, to Genesis, right, where it says that a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they'll become one. Mm -hmm. And then we see in the Gospel of John, Jesus begins to pray for what? Oneness, like he has with his father, and that we would have with him and with one another. Mm -hmm. He's praying that same intimate knowledge of one another, the knowing one another at a oneness level that we almost only associate with marriage. As a, as, a, as a culture of church, I think we only associate that with marriage, and quite poorly, quite honestly, because when the church has a divorce rate of like 60%, or whatever it is now, we clearly don't grasp the, the, the idea of oneness that God has placed in marriage for the purposes of the spiritual life. I, I mean, yeah. it's, it's unfortunately, I think it is a sign of how, how dangerously accurate this text is with the culture and the heart of the church, to actually be murderers and adulterers, idolaters in our relationship with God. Which, oh, and that's the evidence, is that our prayers aren't answered. That's the connection. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, we've, that's, we've been struggling with this. That, that, we've been <laughs> struggling all night with that connection on why he put prayers in here. And that's the connection. How do you know? First John... That's, God, I've been looking at this all day. It's 1 John. Go to 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 and 15. I've been looking at this all day, and I, ha- I haven't seen this. I was just telling Stefan as we were in the back going, why did he put prayer here? What's the deal? 1 John uh, chapter 5, uh, verse 13. You want to read that? Sure. 13 through 15. All right. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. Three times he says no Mm -hmm. in that particular passage. Is that the same? I I, I put him on the spot. Yes, I got him. (laughs) So, but, but here's the point. We're looking, at, we're looking at 1 John, and he says, I'm going to write this stuff to you so that you will understand. You'll know that you have eternal life. And how do we know that? Because when we ask for things in his will, we have confidence that it's going to be given to us because we know the Father. Mm-hmm. We know him. When, when we are fighting and quarreling, when there's, when there's coveting and murder in the church... Because of our anger for one another and our relationship with one another is broken in that way and there's not oneness, the prayers of the church are not being answered because we're not asking according to his will. We're not asking in the knowledge of him, of, of our relationship with him. Yeah, I hate it when it's like this because I would have loved to have had more time to think about this <laughs> and process how we would talk about this. Um but I honestly, I believe that's why James is putting that in here, is to say, look, guys, it's evident in your prayer life. Mm-hmm. You pray for things that fulfill your passions. You're asking God to do the stuff that you want him to do. You're not praying for his will. And therefore, you're not getting what you're wanting, and it's making you mad, and you're taking it out on one another. Yeah. Man, is that us? That's the fear is, do we look like the world? Are we not setting ourselves apart in this battle? Bingo. And that's the exact, that's what he references right there. He says, don't you know? Aren't you aware that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And, and 
back in chapter three, these things should not be this way. <laughs> this should not be so. It, yeah. it should not be. And, which, yeah. which he kind of cranks that up just a little bit when he goes, you adulterers. <laughs> and, yeah. Wouldn't that be a great way to start the church service? You murderers and adulterers, listen up. God has something to say to us. <laughs> Wake us up. Wake happen? up, everybody. <laughs> I, I, this honestly takes me back to Job's, to the passage where, where God's talking to Job. Hey, uh, gird up your loins and prepare to be talked to like a man. Get ready because this is going to hurt. But I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you the, how it is. And um, we actually see that so we have several passages referencing this idea of being spoken to uh, of looking at our lives, recognizing that we're enemies of God and, and friends with the world. Um, and and that, the first passage in that one is John, I think it's John 15, um, 18 and 19. <clears throat> let, me, let me read this one for you, John 15, 18 through 19. If, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just translate this, and, <laughs> and I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Let me reread that. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, and I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. You and I are wrestling with the idea in the back that, man, if we're not facing some kind of opposition from the world, if we're not facing some kind of rejection or hatred or disdain from the world, it's, in t it's probable, it's probably even accurate to say that we don't know God. It should, it should put some questions in our head, huh? It should at least cause us to ask the question. Yeah. Do I know the Lord? Am I really following Jesus? Because if they hated him, they're supposed to hate us if we're following him. And, and that's, you know, we were talking about what, what is the name that is known in the world? What is our name? You know, hopefully the goal is that our name is Jesus. <laughs> yeah. But that's not the case. <clears throat> We have, unfortunately, we blend in very well with the world. And yeah. we're very comfortable as a church with the world. Not this church necessarily, but generally, you know, generally speaking. speaking yeah. yeah. And you would have a hard the, time distinguishing. Yeah. And, and the, I mean, I think the thing that convicts me there is that my voice as a Christian is not louder than, than the, the general, the church, you know, yeah. the, the, the apostate church. Right, right. That that's the voice that's heard. Why aren't we loud? Why aren't we, you know, standing up for our faith? And I guess we haven't had to, but. Well, don't you think it's also because we lack the confidence that we see in First John right there, to know the will of the Father. So we lack the confidence to be bold. We lack the, we lack the knowledge of his will. We lack the intimacy of the relationship. And so therefore we're timid. Mm -hmm. I mean, the disciples, when they, were facing, when they were facing persecution, they prayed for boldness, not safety. We pray for safety. Mm -hmm. We pray for for. The easing of the conflict, the for the re, the healing for the relaxing of the pain for the for the relenting from discipline. We pray for all of those things, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't pray for those things. But I wonder if if we really understood the will of the Father. I mean, J, chapter one of James: Consider it pure joy when you face various trials. Why? Knowing that that process produces completeness and maturity, mm -hmm. that we will be done, we'll be whole, we'll be restored back to what we were designed to by the will of the Father. Nah, <laughs> we don't want to do that. Okay, that was sarcasm. That's not, the, the, you know, that's the, I mean, there's an absolute struggle in this. Mm -hmm. 
There is an intense battle that's happening because in my flesh, I want it gone. I think, you know, the, the first the first sin came from a lie. You know, and it was Satan's yeah, lie. Of, it was deception. It was yeah. a deception. Yep. And and I think that this <clears throat> this boils back to the same thing. It's 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 an issue of doctrine and deception. Because <laughs> As Christians, we're told that we are saved, that we're redeemed, that Christ has paid the price, it's done, it's finished, and right. that's it. Right. And so I think we, and that is true. Yes, you know, it our, is true. Our position. Absolutely. We are safe yep. in the arms of Christ. Yep. Um, but that's not the end of the story. Right. And we, I, maybe it's Satan getting his fingers and his tongue involved in in the in our doctrinal issues convincing us as a church that that's it that we can be <laughs> well now see that would require the pharisees to have been following the father of lies oh wait that's what jesus said they were doing yeah i think i mean ugh okay. <laughs> What if that's true? What what I mean, that's what Satan's been doing from the beginning of time, right? And it's his original plan. Why do we think that we're safe from from his lies now? What if what if Satan's actual strategy for the church was to convince us that we were so important that we were so important that salvation was all about us, church was all about us, my preferences my desires, my likes, my dislikes, that, that when, I, when I'm offended, when I'm displeased, when I'm uncomfortable, that I should change churches and that I should let people, everybody around me know that I'm that way so that they all have to change. What if that was Satan's plan? What if that was a strategy? I don't know, like he would use deception to distract the church and keep us so wrapped up in our little pathetic lives that we were not spending our times impacting and reflecting the glory of God to our neighborhoods and to the lost around us. Whew. That's scary, isn't it? That's, at some level, it's super convicting because I feel like, I feel like I would prefer a gospel that said, it's all about you, don't worry about anybody else. I feel like in my own heart, that I would gladly receive that. Mm -hmm. And now that I've got my fire insurance, I can just sit on the sidelines and do whatever I want because I'm in. That'd be a great deception too. Wouldn't it be great if we were redeemed and perfected once? And we were rich. <laughs> and comfortable. Brilliant! <laughs> and comfortable. Oh my goodness, we have a whole theology ready to go. <laughs> You know, we're being sarcastic about it, but the problem is, is that I think that that's ultimately that really is the reality of the, we know the enemy. We know his strategies. It's written down for us in the text and we get to watch him do it over and over and over again. And we fall prey to it mm -hmm. over and over. In fact, I think the text even says that he appears as an angel of light in the effort to deceive the church. Mm -hmm. What a terrible reality it would be if we as the American church had become so self-absorbed, so disconnected from the will of God, the relationship with God, that we were accepting in complete uh, uh, um, abandonment a deception from the enemy about what the church looked like and we were actually sharing it as the gospel. How terrifying that would be if that was the reality of the prostate church that we see uh, explained in Revelation in the seven churches. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how many of you read uh, that process. You go read through the churches and you're like, okay, I sure hope I'm this one. What did First John just say? How do we know? How do we know? 
We can know. We can be secure in our eternal life. How? <laughs> it's knowing God. Check out what this says. You're going to love this passage too then because it's in 1 John. What a great segue. I wish we had planned that. <laughs> 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17 says this. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, and here, here's the three things that are in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father but from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. I think that this would be a really, really good time to wrestle with the fact with what James ends in, in chapter 5, or do you suppose... It is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in you. It's very interesting in that text that the cross references to this go to go to Paul speaking in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, uh, specifically 2 Corinthians 6.16. Um, but when we think about this idea of jealousy, when we think about how God uh, describes himself as jealousy, I think one of the very first times that it shows up is actually in the Ten Commandments. And it's in Exodus 20, verses 1 through 6. Um, would you mind reading that for us? Sure. Exodus 20, 1 through 6. Well, that's awesome. Somehow. <clears throat> verse 1. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Uh, the description, uh, the, the definition of jealous in here is is the idea that God is rightfully desiring the focal point of attention because He is rightfully the one that deserves this worship. It, it's not it's not a it's not jealous like it is in my life when I want something that I don't have, so therefore I become jealous and I have sin in my heart. This is God rightfully desiring the designed relationship that He made with all creation. And he describes for us in that text how intimate, how personal, how private that relationship is supposed to be, how exclusive that relationship is supposed to be, that there is to be nothing else between us and him. Nothing. Mm -hmm. There's times where I think we look at that and we go, oh, what a, what a self-righteous God. Well, you can't be self-righteous when you're the, I don't think you can be self-righteous when you're the definition of righteous. <laughs> that, that doesn't quite fit. No. But we think of that as being this uh, egotistical God who's like, I'm above everything else, and therefore you must worship me. Yes. And the clay say to the potter. <laughs> Bingo. How, how do we stand there and shake our fist at God who created us and said, you can't say this about yourself or, or me. It, it's the epitome of this of broken relationship self of self-righteousness yeah. and the pride of life, the, the desires of the flesh, the desires of... It's exactly what the world and the lies of Satan has perpetrated on us. And James is saying, this is in your church. And therefore, it's adultery and idolatry, and it should not be because God is jealous and he's rightfully jealous of the intimacy and the relationship that he's designed us to have for him. And it would, it would be totally wrong if he wasn't jealous. I mean, you think, think about yeah. that relationship, a, a husband and wife, and the husband is, you know, either one are, are, are not faithful. And they, I don't, sure and they don't care. Yeah, they don't care. That, that's... <sighs> you can't wrong. be in that relationship. No. I mean, like, you can't have intimacy in that relationship. Mm -hmm. There's no exclusivity. There's no trust. I'm so thankful that God who is who he says he is and that he is a jealous God. Yeah. That he's made that, that <clears throat> covenant with his people a, a selective covenant, you know. Yeah. 
I think it'd be good for us to end tonight with our last passage, and that's Jeremiah 31, um, 31. This idea of the Spirit dwelling within us. And there's some dialogue about that, right? We have the commentaries that people get in there, and man puts his best ideas to this. And, and there's some that say that this is about the, the Spirit that God put us in us back in uh, Genesis that he breathed into us. And, and I think there could be some the, the reality of that, because uh, in second Cor- or in 1 Corinthians, I think it's 6, 6, 17 or something like that, where you actually see um, Paul talking about the, dis- the, the temple of God that we're designed to be and how we shouldn't be pu- pu- uh, polluting that with the world or involved in idolatry. And then you see him say it again, a very similar thing in 2 Corinthians 6, 16, but this time he actually references the, the Jeremiah passage of 31, 31. And so my, in my heart, and, and the kind of how I'm looking at this is saying, I, I think James is probably saying, yeah, God wants both. The spirit, the life, the soul that he designed and created in us, he jealously learn, yearns to be in that intimate relationship with us. Um, and he, for the church, he says, you're already in covenant marriage with me, and I've given you my Holy Spirit and your spirit, and I'm desiring both of them to be one, to be in unity, to be an intimate, exclusive relationship with me. And Jeremiah actually says that this prophecy is coming. He prophesies about this new covenant and the relationship, ultimately, that's fulfilled in Christ. And we see that in Jeremiah 31. 31 through 34. You want to read that one for us? Sure. <clears throat> My voice is going. <laughs> <laughs> Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. <laughs> But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Like that, that sums up wow. the whole thing because he uses the terminology, I was a husband to them. I, we were in covenant, mm-hmm. and they violated that. And, and then he says this new covenant will be in such a way that you won't say to one another, hey, know the Lord, know the Lord. Because, why? Because we will know him. Mm-hmm. And in that relationship, he will forgive their iniquity and will remember their sins no more. Really, the deepest conviction in this is have we as the church bought into the lie of self-righteous idolatry in the church? That this church, that the, the relationship between us and the church, us and one another, us and God, is all about me, my passions, my desires, my selfish needs, or is this about him? Is it about knowing the will of the Father? Is it about knowing God? And therefore, responding to his prompting, responding to his discipline, responding to trials and persecution and the word of God in a a humble, contrite, uh, repentant manner that that, that literally comes and says, Lord, a wretched man that I am, I'm undone because of your goodness, because of your holiness, and because I'm in a battle. I am in the midst of warfare that is beyond me. And, 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 and I'm desperately in need. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, this is something that's been pointed at, pointed to from the beginning. You know, God has his eternal purposes. And I, I can't begin to question, you know, why sin? You know, why, why a good God? You know, those yeah. questions are beyond me. And at, at the point of the, at the end of the day, it's, you kind of have to conclude God, I don't know, you know, I, and I, right. I'm not in a place where I can know that, you know, that some things are beyond our intellect. Yeah. Um, but from the beginning, God showed his presence to us. Mm-hmm. His presence was in the garden of Eden and he walked with, he Adam. walked with them. His presence was on the mountain and it was terrible to behold. Yeah. And he, he was going to have a relationship with the Israelites 
on a personal level, but they didn't want it. They said, no, you, use Moses. Yeah, talk you're, through somebody you're too, else. You're too scary for us. <laughs> you're terrifying. Yeah. Exactly. And then, you know, the tabernacle and all the, the typology, all the pictures of the tabernacle, mm. the temple, and then in this new dispensation in us. In us. He dwells in us. <laughs> what responsibility that is. And, and I... That should take us to our knees. Absolutely. And God, am, am I a proper dwelling place? Is it Job that talks about <laughs> the heavens are his is his throne yeah. and, and the yeah. earth his footstool? What what house would you build? You know what? Yeah. Tabernacle would you build for me? What dwelling? There's. N- it, but it, he has the dwelling. He's made it. He's made it. It's us in us that that. <laughs> It, 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 just the discussion to even go into the process to say, well, how can I be worthy? How can you can't get over yourself? <laughs> it's not possible for you and for me to get to a point where God's where we're worthy of His dwelling. It was because of Jesus. That's Romans eight. There is therefore no now no condemnation. Not because somehow we've figured it out. Not because somehow we know God well enough that He's like, hey, friend. But because Jesus made the way. And I, I honestly, I really think that until we come to that reality, until we look at our, our lives and we say, God, I'm, I can't possibly meet this, this thing. I can't possibly get there. We're really not ready to engage in the warfare that's happening in our hearts and in our souls. We don't, because we don't know him. Right. We, we should be undone in the presence of the holy God. Yeah. And the conclusion shouldn't be, it shouldn't be, oh, he's paid the price, we're done. Right, therefore I'm in. Therefore I'm in. The conclusion is, you should be in awe yeah. of this God and what he's done. Yeah. And stop thinking about me. And even Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. And all these things will be added unto you. But this is about knowing the Father. This is about recognizing the warfare that we're in and turning to God, turning to Jesus and following him. So do you know the Father? Do you know Jesus? Are you engaged in the battle? Are we engaged in the battle, actively engaged? I believe that should be the question for the church that should wreck our hearts. Even tonight, How many of us have been complacently going to church, living our lives with no regard whatsoever to the conflict, to the the fighting, to the bickering, to to the anger and the disputes, the the, the brokenness in our church? And I'm not saying in in Liberty Lake Church, there is, there probably is. I'm assuming you're all saints and and you have no problems. (laughs) I... Actually, in my interview process here, I said, if you if you guys hire me, you're just adding to your church's problems. <laughs> so let's just be honest about it, you guys. We're a mess. And we need to wrestle with this truth. We need to engage this and say, God, open my eyes that I can see you. Open my ears that I can hear from you. Open my heart that I would recognize where my flaws are. God, show me in my own response to you, in my own behavior within the context of your body, how am I living? Is it selfishly? Is it self-ambition? Is it self-focused? Or am I truly interested in your will? Do I know who you are and am I responding in that way? I think that's the challenge for us that's been the conviction of my heart. Yeah. This week as I've wrestled, it's only Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. Feels like Friday. Oh, it feels like Friday. It yeah. feels like it's been a whole week of wrestling with this. You know, one of my one of my favorite quotes uh, is actually from the Chronicles of Narnia. Oh yeah. And it it's in the last book, The Last Battle. And uh, I forget who says it, but the quote is further up and further in. Wow. You know, yeah. And that should be our attitude with this struggle, yep. with this battle. It's like let let's continue. You know, and it's not there is there is hope in this life. Right. In fulfilling those things and, and in knowing God. Yeah. And and there's things to enjoy. I mean, he's given us all things yep. richly. Yep. 
to enjoy. Yeah. I mean, he's a God of, of pleasure. He, he enjoys those things, and he wants us to enjoy those things uh, to the, just so they don't distract us from him and right. from the main thing. Yep. I think it's First Peter that says we've been given every spiritual blessing through Christ. We have, we have everything we need. Mm. Is part of it, but we just got to get in, <laughs> stand up, get in a fight. Let's start. Do, let's get after this. All right, we got to let these guys go. <laughs> Thanks for hanging with us. Uh, I, I really appreciate you being here. It's been a pleasure having Stefan here. I'm really looking forward to wrestling with us over the next few weeks as we continue to engage in James and uh, Ben Napcher. I'll be here with me next week, and then. Um, these guys are going to start switching out places, and one of these times they'll probably kick me out, the two of them will be there. <laughs> It'll be awesome. <laughs> Let me pray and close this this evening, um, and I, I just really want to encourage you to engage in the battle. Don't sit on the sidelines. If you don't know you're in a war, if you don't know you're in the fight, then you're not. I'll just be that honest. If you don't think Christianity is a battle, if you don't feel like you're engaged in a, in a spiritual battle for your soul, then you're probably not, and it's time to engage. Father, this evening I just pray that you would convict our hearts, convict our souls, where we are sitting on the sidelines, where we are engaged in the adultery of our spiritual relationship with you, where we are engaged in idolatry with the world, where we're loving the world instead of you where we have chosen to be enemies of you instead of your friend. God, where we are pursuing our own selfish desires, the, the, the desires of the flesh, the desires of, of our eyes, uh, the, the, the pride of life. God, that you would open our eyes to see that reality and that you would convict our hearts, that we would turn from that way and we would engage, we would stand up as, as Paul challenges us in Ephesians 6 to, to do all that you can do to stand and then stand. Putting on the armor of God and engaging in the warfare, the battle that is raging around us, that is actively happening, that we have been freed from the bondage of sin to engage in this battle. God, I just pray that you would give us boldness to speak the truth. You would give us boldness to live lives that are different than the world, to live lives that reflect your holiness, your glory, the, the transformation that you are doing in each of us. The love, the steadfast love that you extend to, to that you extended to us while we were your enemies. I just pray, Father, that you would wake up. Uh, our church, wake up the church and bring revival, bring transformation. As we were praying in the elder board the other night, God, I just pray that if it be your will, you'd allow us to wear out our baptism because so many people are coming to know you. Not in our church, but in our communities. I just pray that you would open our eyes to what you're doing in your name. Lord Jesus, we ask all these things for your glory and not our own. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for joining us tonight. We'll see you next week. That was an hour.